This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with lead foundation phase coach at Sheffield Wednesday, Chris Butt. He discusses using theoretical models in a practical setting and how this helps the players, the use of futsal in their programme and the benefits they have seen, as well as the process of supporting players during the Steel City derby against Sheffield United. Please be part of the growth of this podcast by sharing it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So, Chris, really appreciate you jumping online. Obviously, I know we caught up briefly then, but sounds like for you, relatively stress free and all good at Christmas time, which is nice. Yeah, we were lucky to avoid COVID, like I said. Um, everyone remained safe and well. We managed to see sort of the close family on, on both my side and, and my partner's side. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a pleasing aspect of the break. Perfect. So in terms of role for you at the moment, do you just want to explain to people kind of what your role is and maybe what that entails as a job spec uh, perspective? Yeah, so currently foundation phase manager at Sheffield Wednesday. Um, so the main bulk of the role, I guess, is managing players, parents and staff. Um, so typical responsibilities are sort of sending out any communication to, to parents. Um, where we're training, what the training times are. And certainly through COVID, that's been difficult because there's been a few chops and changes. Um, typically, pre-COVID, we've got more of a set routine and there's not too much of a responsibility there. It's a little bit more straightforward. Um, similarly, with staff, um, sort of communicating with them, feeding back on their session delivery and, and little bits and bobs like that. Um, we've got a, a, a WhatsApp chat like, like most sort of phases or groups have um, and we communicate regularly in that about certain things whether it's how the games have gone at the weekend or whatever else um, and then the last bit is is the parents um, and again they're, they're a really important and, and big part of what we do um, so sort of managing and, and working alongside them is is another big part of the role so I guess they're probably the three three main parts of, of what my, my role is. Perfect. And so in terms of what a Sheffield Wednesday player looks like, if if we were to come and watch your game at a weekend or watch your training during the week, what would we expect to see? What what would you hope that we'd see from you and your group? The the hope for the club is is that we develop players that represent the, the city. Um so Sheffield, the steel city being sort of working class. Um City, we're trying to create players that reflect that on the football pitch. So we'd like to think that our players would sort of try and outwork and fight most of the teams. Um, so first and foremost, that'd be the, the bare bones of what we're going after. Are, are they a worker? Are they a fighter? After that, I guess it's probably just targeted individual strengths. Um, I think when you look at anyone who sort of reaches a top level, the reason they get there is because what they're good at, not because of what they're not so good at. So... Um, yeah, I think we're quite individualised, certainly within the, within the foundation phase, which I manage. Um, so we sort of lean towards developing strengths and super strengths and, and really harnessing an individual approach. So when we're talking about that individual approach, what type of work would you do with a player? So let use, for example, my super strength might be finishing for an under nine, that might be what I'm really good at. How would you go around as an individual and then as a coach and staff supporting me in that area? Like with all academies, our players have got individual learning plans um, and we've got that phased into our coaching programme. So on week 11 is, is individual learning plan week where the boys from nines to 11s are all grouped on their individual learning plans. So you might have the under nines, the under 10s, under 11s that are all working on finishing together for the full week. Um, and that's one of the ways we do it. The other ways we do it is we was chatting before we came online about um, the constraints of the facility being quite small. Um, so we only really take small numbered groups. Um, so if one of the coaches is leading the more collective group um, and, and sort of overseeing the whole session, 
it's on then the second coach to go and individualise um, that session to meet the individual needs. So it could be a, a build up from the back session, for example, that will probably at some point come with some opposition. So it might be that you're working with the striker on transition to score with a variety of, of finishing techniques or whatever. In terms of a, a planning context between staff, how would they go around um, actually facilitating that? So obviously if you've got someone who's doing the overriding session, would they sit there, sit down with the other coach and say, okay, you're going to work with Tommy today? Or would that, is just that, is that just like a natural flow as, as the session's going on? I think everyone, every coaching pair would work a little bit differently on that based on either what their full-time role is or whatever. So we've got a, a coaching pair who are both working in primary schools. So it's likely that either they'll plan it the day before. So our working week looks like a Monday training, a Wednesday training. Thursday, we'll have a futsal night every other week for, for mixed age groups. And then Sunday, we'll play the game. So whilst one coaching group might plan Monday on Sunday, um, and then that's where they might go, right, I'll lead this week. If you individualise with X, Y and Z, he might be low on confidence. If you work with him on his super strengths and sort of try and build his confidence up or whatever, they might piece it together like that. Other coaches, it might be sort of a little bit more implicit where one of them naturally takes the lead and the other one naturally um, individualises and, and, and then they're sort of required to piece that together before the session at some point, whether that's sort of on the phone on the way in if they're not getting there as early as they'd like or if they arrive in person, they've got time to do it sort of together before going out onto the grass you mentioned around your, your group sizes being relatively small um have you seen any particular benefits of that and kind of what numbers would you normally be looking at yeah i think in terms of numbers we don't take a specific number it's not sort of we're, we're only going to take up to 12 because then what if you've got 14 players that you feel are yeah sort of worthy of being in your program and you want to work with um so it's not limited to a specific number um, I think personally the benefits I see from it is it suits the constraints of, of our context so um, working in smaller spaces if you've got a lot of players on there you start to the, the physical ret return sorry start to diminish a little bit um, I also think working with small number groups you get to know them really well individually and that really helps you as, as a coach when you're getting to know what, what makes them tick and what are their super strengths? What are their, their areas to improve? So between two coaches, you might have 12 players to get to know that six each. If you compare that to maybe a larger group of sort of 18 or 20, it dilutes the, the personal feel. And I think that's probably one of our one of our strengths as a club. I think that's really interesting what you're saying there and probably something that will resonate with a lot of people. Like quite often when we say it's about taking big groups or small groups, they go, oh, we do it for this rationale, that rationale. But very few people go, well, actually, for the environment that we've got, be it facilities or capacity to actually support them, we feel like this is the best number. I think that's quite refreshing to hear, like, someone say that actually, no, because of we know what our parameters are, so we know we can cater for these players, got kind of a high quality. And if we took loads, loads more than that, it would diminish what we're actually able to offer. I think that's quite refreshing to hear. Yeah, I think um, so as, as we look through our groups that have maybe done better when they go top end as well, you've got sort of a, a nucleus of players that have been with you from a, a younger age anyway. Um, so yeah, working with sort of a smaller group is something that, that probably suits us. And then as they get to the older ages, you drip feed one or two in. Um, and they probably get a richer experience from it as well as, as players, whatever they're the outcome of their experience with us is whether it's they go on to be a scholar at the club or they go on and, and they leave us at 11 or 14, whatever it might be. They probably felt more important as an individual during the time with us because they were a part of a smaller group. So they weren't one of 20, they were one of 12 and they were made to feel more special because of that. And I, and I only think that has a, a positive benefit on the players sort of relationship with sport and activity for, for life, never mind. So sort of, yeah, professional football in which just happens to be the, the environment we operate in. And yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. And something else that interested me that you mentioned there was around the futsal being part of your programme quite regularly. So 
what what's the purpose of you guys having in that having that in fortnightly? And again, what um, negatives or benefit, benefits have you seen from groups that have had long term exposure to that? Yeah, I think um, one or two of us are on the futsal UA for B course at the minute. I think the more you get educated by people who are experts in the futsal game, the more you see the transfer and the the relevance of that when looking to develop footballers. Um, we've not had it in our programme for too long. Again, COVID sort of hampered that a little bit with the restriction of indoor spaces. Um, I'm sure that's not the last time that'll crop up in our conversation. But so in terms of a long-term benefit, I could only go off sort of stories of, of professional players now and the benefits that they sort of give. I think that's probably as, as valid as anything I could say. Um, in terms of the benefits we've seen, with us having small groups, our, our under nines or under tens largely play seven v seven, so it puts them in the five v five environment, which then repeatedly provides certain appropriate developmental challenges. Um, there's a sort of a, an increase of touches. There's an increase of one v ones. That Manchester United did a four v four report a, a while back, and it's probably similar benefits to that. In terms of being futsal specific. Obviously, there's adapting to the hard court. There's the use of the sole of the foot. You can't play back to the goalkeeper more than once in, in that half. So then you've got to learn to deal with the ball under pressure and try and find a way of playing forward or supporting the ball underneath. Um, so in terms of, for us, and the aim in the foundation phase being developing the widest skill set possible to, to then be applied at youth development phase, I think it offers sort of, yeah, a, a nice a nice way of doing that which might not necessarily feel exactly like football um, so when you're looking at sort of early specialisation and early engagement it's, it's probably nice from that perspective as well And do you see any players who either struggle in futsal who do maybe better outside or vice versa that might be having a tough time of it kind of in a football context but actually when you put them on a futsal court they find that slightly easier or they highlight some of the super strengths that might be hiding in a 7v7 uh, capacity. Yeah, it, to be honest, it's probably nothing that's consciously crossed my mind until you've mentioned it then. Um, but yeah, you've got certain players who might be physically more mature than others that when they get on a bigger pitch and they've got more space, they have more success because of, yeah, simply that, their physical capabilities. Whereas when you put them in the futsal hall, it's a little bit quicker and maybe more reliant on technique at times um yeah they, they have to adapt to those demands and on the flip side the smaller players who might not have the physical capability to deal with the demands of the bigger pitch i'm thinking certainly when you get to the the under 11 that it's 9v9 there's more body on the pitch um yeah they get a chance to sort of continue to show what their super strengths are whether it's play, so yeah, combining in in small areas and, and whatever else. So yeah, now you've now you've said it, it, it probably is nice from from that perspective as well. And in terms of a games program, um, I guess you can think this. Do you ever play any futsal games? Um, and if you don't, kind of what does your normal regular futsal? Uh, sorry, your normal regular games program look like? Yeah, we we're lucky enough to be involved in the Premier League Cat One Two Games program. Um, and they have sort of one to two futsal competitions a year. So we get involved in them. Um, they're, they're really good. Um, and then what we've done recently is try to seek out private academies and, and people that um, play futsal on a regular basis to sort of really stress our boys in their environment, so to speak. Um, so we've done that once for each age group leading up to Christmas. We'll try and get it in a, a couple more times after Christmas as well. Um, so, granted, it's probably only a, a small part of our programme, but I think it's definitely something that makes our programme not unique, but it, it makes it a little bit different. Um, and I think it certainly adds value. I think the interesting thing for me with futsal as well is around the probably number of goal mouth actions that you might not necessarily get in, in a wider capacity. So, you know, because it is so quick, you can go back to front and get a shot on target where you know 9v9 as you said it's a lot bigger distances to be able to do that so imagine for your goalkeepers and your strikers in particular actually the value of you know getting a lot of exposure is probably quite good for them yeah i think 
what we found is when delivering the sessions, the pre- players really seem to like a whole part, a whole session structure within the futsal. Not really too sure why. They just, yeah, that seems to be their preference. So we try and, and stick to that structure with, with the groups because that's sort of what they like. Um, it's not our most common structure in the football sessions. So again, it's adding a little bit of variety there. But to touch on sort of the the uh, the point you had of our goalkeepers getting lots of repetitions, it definitely happens all the time, particularly repetitions of shot stopping is one thing, but sort of if they catch it, they're then trying to set off a counter attack and there's repetition in, in that. So yeah, I think that's probably what the game offers from for, for strikers, for goalkeepers, but for everyone in terms of there's, there's such a repetition of certain challenges that are really appropriate for the development of players at this age. Um, and they're constantly getting feedback from that because they've they've had a go at it once, it was successful or it wasn't successful. And instantly, in probably, I don't know, 20 seconds, they've probably got another chance to go at it again. So it's really good from that sort of guided discovery, trial and error point of view as well. I'm just thinking as you're talking there, we, I had a guest on just before Christmas called Paul Barry, who was talking about ide- players identifying what comfortable and uncomfortable possession looks like or secure and insecure. And I imagine actually futsal is probably perfect for that because the transitions are so quick, your ability to identify the what secure possession and insecure, comfortable, uncomfortable is the difference between you being in a position to stop the counter-attack or the position where all of a sudden they've got a 3v1 against your goalie. Um, so I'd imagine in that capacity, actually, futsal is probably a really good way if groups are working on that transition period piece or period um, for them to work on that and get loads of repetitions just by the nature of the game. Yeah, definitely. I sort of touched on one or two of us being on the Futsal UA for B course earlier, and that probably opened our eyes as to how tactical it is. Um, there was sort of saying like at elite level futsal, they'll probably invert the wingers because then they're receiving the ball on the strong side of foot, albeit still on the safe side away from the defender, which sort of yeah was never really a consideration in in our minds. That then sort of offers you two um, two options to go with it. Do you play? Your, your wing is inverted if you're playing sort of a one one two one. Do you play them on the inverted side so that they can sort of protect the ball on their stronger foot? Or do you say, no, we're going to play you on your proper side, but we're, we're going to teach you about the value of, again, keeping the ball safe side to maybe try and have secure possession, but you've got to do that on what's probably your least preferred side as well. So again, that's a, a great example as to where it can be a really valuable tool for development in, in our opinion. Yeah, that's really interesting as well, because if you have that with the, you know, the younger kids and saying we're going to play you on your dominant side, but you've got to learn to protect the ball on your non-dominant foot. It's a great way for them to get regular practice at it, which they, again, might not be so keen on, but for their development, it's going to be crucial. Definitely. And the game demands that of them, because if they don't receive it on their safe side, it's likely they're going to get the, the ball pinched off of them because it is such a small space and, and you're constantly under pressure. So the importance of it is is intensified within within the game of futsal. And in your experience from what you've seen, do you find that the players are more creative in futsal than they are outside? Some are and, and some are and I and I think it probably it probably goes back to the type of player they are generally. So your more creative players will do some really outrageous things in futsal because it has that it has that label of being our futsals for skills and futsals to be creative. So if they're that type of player, they really sort of harness that and, and take it to a new level, whereas some of the other boys might go, right, well, if it is like that, I'll go, so these are my super strengths. I, I'm a good, great passer of the ball. I move it in minimal touches and I'll find ways to go and combine with others and play like that so yeah I guess hopefully that answers um, answers your point yeah no for sure so moving on slightly you mentioned around your, your games program and being part of the Premier League games program in terms of I guess what challenges that provides for you as a club um, what type of teams are you playing against and what type of challenges does it does it provide because I imagine it's quite varied and you'll have different 
different um, strength of opposition, different ways of playing from opposition, etc. Yeah, it, it's great. Um, one week we might be at sort of one of the larger Premier League clubs like a Liverpool, uh, a Manchester City, a Manchester United. Another week, no disrespect, we could be at somebody similar to ourselves, like a Hull City. We might be over the City against Sheffield United. And like you said, they all provide different challenges um, and they meet the needs of our individuals in different ways. So where our players might be technically, tactically a little bit shy of a larger Category 1 academy, it's meeting their needs in a psychological way of, look, you've got to be resilient to keep trying to do the things we're demanding of you or the things that you know are going to lead to success, even though they might not lead to success in, in the short term with sort of if you're measuring success by the result or, or the performance. And then you flip that to a, playing sort of a, a more local Category 2 team where they're probably at similar levels and they're, and they're getting technical, tactical returns as well as the psychological returns. So it, it provides yeah a real broad range of experiences and challenges for the, for the players, which is great. And is there any particular team that you play against that does something quite unique? Um, if, if I think, for example, when I was coaching before and into recruitment, Cardiff used to go man for man all over the pitch quite often, which was quite unique in under 9, 10, 11 football and it caused quite a lot of issues when you were playing out, etc. Is there any other clubs that maybe do something a little bit different that is a challenge for the players when, when they're on the pitch? Yes, yeah, there are. Everyone sort of has their, their own little styles and, and uniquenesses, if that's even a word. Um, I think, again, I'm, I'm reluctant to compliment the other side of the city, but we, we played them 7v7 at, at one age quite recently, and they almost set up in, in a false goalkeeper, one defender, three midfielders and two strikers. From there, one of the strikers would drop into centre midfield to almost overload our midfield three with a four. If they didn't get it in the first line with their defender, one of the two centre midfielders would drop into, into the defence. So then it causes a lot of issues of who follows players and um, do you mark zonally, do you not, do you go man for man? So that yeah causes some, some real trouble. That was probably the first time I've ever seen anything like that done. Um, so that was probably the most recent example to my mind of, of what you're talking about of a, of a real unique challenge where yeah it becomes a little bit more about right how are we going to manage that how are we going to educate the players to manage that within the chaos of in that example a steel city derby albeit they are just sort of 10 11 year old children so how did you how did you help the players in that context it was tough truthfully um so we we tried to get them to realize the problems that they were facing um so there was a bit of a discovery element of it where we're sort of prodding them to to get them to recognise it for themselves um, we then gave them sort of two options, they could go man for man or they could sort of choose which player went and pressed if one of the central midfield players dropped into the defensive line um, they went for the latter, they, they chose that one of the wingers was going to jump um, if the central midfielder player dropped wide so they could always protect the middle, which yeah, we were fairly happy with. But when it actually went onto the pitch, it's obviously much more difficult in, in practice, particularly when you've not worked on these things in a safer, calmer environment sort of throughout the training week or whatever. So, yeah, it, it was difficult, but it was a, a great learning experience for both players, but us as coaches as well. Because like I said, it's not, it's not something I've come across before. So it was um, interesting. I think we'd be remiss not to probably say, you know, it is a derby game and <laughs> that will heighten the level of things. How is it for you on a derby week, I guess, trying to manage the emotions of the players? Because they'll be aware of it. They're aware of the situation. If they're Wednesday fans or if dad's a Wednesday fan or mum's a Wednesday fan or whatever, that's probably going to add a little bit to it as well. So how, during those weeks, do you go around framing that type of fixture, making it so they realise, obviously, it's a developmental opportunity more than anything else? I, I think it's, it's really tough, truthfully. I think because, like you said, on one side of the coin, it is a local derby. It's 
Sheffield Wednesday, Sheffield United, just like Manchester United, Manchester City. But in the same breath, it is just eight, ten-year-olds playing football against another eight, ten-year-olds. So I'm not sure there's a right or wrong way to go about it. Um, I think for us, it's we set sort of the clear objectives that we're going after in each phase of the game. So we'll have a, an in-possession target, an out-of-possession target, a target on transition. Um, and we'll revisit those targets to determine in, and to measure whether we've been successful in the game, regardless of scoreline. That said, like, like you've alluded to, it, it is Sheffield Wednesday because Sheffield United and the scoreline will matter to many people on many levels. Um, so, yeah, it, it's difficult. I'm not sure there's a right or a wrong way, but that's sort of the way we go about it, by trying to create more probably process-based objectives or, or outcomes that we try and focus on to sort of quieten the, the noise of the game, I guess. And do you see a difference along the pathway? Because obviously I know you have, I know you focus mainly on the foundation phase, but you'll have an understanding of what that looks like in the youth development phase and PDP phase, etc. So for you, do you see a difference to what the fixtures at under nines and the, the way the players act at under nines, the way that looks maybe at 11s or 12s, to the way that looks at 15s, 16s? Yeah, I think so. I think by the, the very nature of the pathway, the more you get top end, the more important results become as, as a measure of sort of your, your performance and, and whatever else. So, yeah, the, the result becomes slightly more important the, the more you go up, albeit you're still in a, a development pathway. Um, and yeah, that has its implications on player behaviour, it has its implications on coach behaviour. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a difference. The differences are probably there's more, more emphasis on outcome rather than process or performance. And for, for one-off weeks or for, for little periods of time, it's probably not the worst thing because Ultimately, if, if they're lucky enough to end up at that at that top end, that's what they're going to be judged on anyway. So, is it harmful if you if you sort of introduce them to that, albeit gradually, in a development pathway? Probably not. I think that's a really interesting point. That actually, you know, as long as you can frame it right as a coach and you have the right level of understanding that as a one-off week and saying actually we're going to try and win this week within our player characteristics or team characteristics we're going to try and win as well and move away from the development thing maybe that is an opportunity to put more stress or pressure on an individual and then obviously provide them support around that as the game is going on yeah definitely it challenges them in in other ways and I think you, you mentioned giving them the support to deal with that I think that's vital you can't just drop them in the deep and no armbands and think they're going to be able to swim you've got to support them in dealing with the frustrations and dealing with the pressure uh, when the outcome does become a little bit more important Is there any particular strategies or whatnot that you guys have? So do you have a psychology department that come and work with the groups? Is it mainly coach based, pitch based stuff? What does that look like? It's a combination of the two and again hampered by COVID but typically we, we've got a part time sports psychologist with the club um, that might deliver occasional workshops with players and parents because like like we've mentioned parents are a really important part of it and they're probably fundamental to developing some of these psychological characteristics that we want our players to develop um, but yeah I think a lot of it is pitch based um, so if we know we're going into a, a tough game come come the weekend it might be that we make some of the training tough so they experience that and, and we help to support them develop the, the capability of dealing with things when it when it does get tough um, so yeah our coaches have got certain guidelines or, or not guidelines but sort of ways in which they might look to develop commitment ways in which they might look to develop resilience ways they might look to develop a, a variety of um, psychological characteristics in order so that when our players do get to the to the top end they're prepared both technically, tactically, but also psychosocially as well. So looking maybe at resilience, because I think this is one that, you know, we, we, we all want everyone to be, not necessarily just kids. 
Um, in, in a football context, and maybe uh, an example of a practice that you've used previously or something like that, which focuses or lends itself to them having to be resilient in order to get success or deal with failure. Have you got any that particularly spring to mind? I think practices aside, I think the way we probably do it best is planning for individuals rather than the practice. So if we know that a certain player has got a certain strength and we're trying to develop resilience in another player who might find it tough against the other player's strength, then we might pair them up in a, in a practice so then it, yeah, it becomes tough for that player. Particularly, I think, back to it, sort of our individual learning plan weeks where some of the players' psychological um, area for development, if you like, was managing their frustrations. So if they're an under nine or an under 10, they get placed with uh, an older player who's probably looking to develop their confidence. So again, you're, you're meeting both players' needs by pairing them up. Now, whatever practice they're in is probably not as important as who they're paired up against. Now, I could be wrong, or I could be right, but that's probably the, the general consensus that we've come to as a, as a coaching department. I guess that helps when, when you do have those futsal occasions or where you're combining the smaller groups, it allows you that flexibility to move players across as, as is needed to support each player's individual development. Yeah, definitely. And I think it, moving them across rather than up and down, the, the use of language like that is really powerful, um, not just for the, the players, but, but for the parents as well. So looking now, I guess, at some of your experiences, obviously you mentioned around your A for B, uh, football stuff that you're on at the moment, et cetera. Um, and I think from reading and speaking to you before, also a licence, hoping to get signed off. I don't know about yours, but mine got delayed thanks to COVID, which is a bit of a killer. Um, like, but uh, how have you found those experiences? And um, is there anything you've taken away in particular from both of those qualifications? Um, yeah, I think the, the A licence for me, being a predominantly foundation phase coach, I'd, I'd never dealt with so many moving parts. I've never dealt with sort of defending while you're attacking and, and linking the phase of the game together. So that was something that took me sort of out of my comfort zone of working with smaller groups and, and whatever else. Um, I think it also gives you an idea of where you're trying to get the players two um, so when you're working with the boys at sort of 9, 10, 11 you've got an idea of, of what you're preparing them for and I think that's, that's really important um, in terms of I've had probably a little bit of a different pathway to others in that I've followed both outfield and goalkeeping pathways in, in coach education um, largely down to the fact that at 15 after yeah, an underachieving amateur childish playing career with a poor relationship with running I tried playing in net um, so I sort of yeah followed both of them um, probably the, the biggest thing I've had from courses I was on the goalkeeping UA for B course and there was some ex-professionals there and I was young at the time I think it was 19 um, you've got sort of Eric Steele and Martin Thomas and some other big names from the, the goalkeeping coaching um, sphere if you like um, and I was first on, I've put this session on and I've just sort of watched it. I've not coached it. And Eric Steele got all the candidates in and sort of, he didn't make an example of me, but he sort of really used it as a, as a powerful learning tool for myself as to say, look, you, your practice design is really nice, but he's letting four goals. You're going to go and coach him. Um, and that was probably one of the, the times where it was most difficult for me, but also then probably where I've learned the most from, from that difficult situation and particularly coaching courses in general I guess so I get it, this may be hard to recollect but in your head when you had that session on what was your reasoning or your rationale for just allowing it to flow it was probably the fact that the guy in that had played professionally he's letting in goals and I'm thinking well who am I to tell him how to say that he's played at the top level, like, what, what can I possibly help him with? Um, the other thing was probably as a more novice coach, 
my my working memory was probably directed towards right does it look neat is is everything working how it should be is everyone getting the the session so i've probably not noticed enough of why is he letting the goals in why is he um yeah why is he not having as much success as he might might should be having um so yeah there's probably a a few things um but yeah that's that's probably the most powerful experience i've had on a on a coach education course and it wasn't particularly nice for myself so um yeah it's, it's probably interesting there's probably something in that and then in terms of the support that they gave you after because obviously i'd imagine Eric wouldn't have just come in said that and gone have a good day see you later he would have obviously done a little bit of work with you post that what type of things or um what type of effort did he make after to try and either improve your delivery or make a connection etc yeah, he was he was great, Eric. He was I was really lucky to have the the opportunity to work alongside him. He was my um, my tutor for the course, um, so he did my in situ visit to, at Sheffield Wednesday. And I think on the course, him and the rest of the tutors were were really warm. Um, they they sort of said like, look, it's it's just a one off. It's not it's not really a big deal. It, it's just one of those things. And then when he came into club, I was sort of a little bit determined of like, look. I know I'm much better than that, so I'll try and show that. I'm not coaching ex-professional goalkeepers. I'm coaching 13-year-old kids. I'm a little bit more in my comfort zone. And I think once he's observed that, he he saw probably a truer reflection of where I was at and then where he could could help support me. I think the thing that probably helped most, they, they never felt like there was judgment. They never felt like it was like, oh, that was it. He's, he's not very good. He's, he's going to struggle to get to the level. It was sort of, right, this is where he's at. or this is this is what what he's shown us to be where he's at. How can we support him to get where where we need him to 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 pass the course? And is there anything in particular that you've taken from the goalkeeping side that you've then utilised in the outfield context, or any particular techniques that actually are used by goalkeepers that aren't used in the outfielder uh, perspective or coaching environment? I think. Um, it, I'm probably just more informed and educated when trying to coach the goalkeepers. So I know I'm giving them yeah, half decent information and in the absence of a goalkeeping coach, I can add value to all of the players. Um, I think it also made me much better at operating as part of a multidisciplinary team because as a goalkeeping coach, you sort of sometimes can be pushed into the corner You've got the keepers for 40 minutes and then you get the curly finger and the, the outfield coaches want them back. Um, so it made me quite good at building relationships with other coaches, trying to work with them in probably a more optimal manner than is tradition with, within football. And Yeah, I think that's interesting what you said about building those relationships because obviously it's a big one and it? it can be quite isolated. Imagine where you've got a smaller group and then if something goes wrong, the outfielder plays on the goalkeeper and stuff. So imagine it has made you more aware of that dynamic of actually how do you support the goalkeeper coach when he comes across, not just the goalkeeper themselves? Yeah, definitely. And I think, listen, I'm not, I don't want to be sat here sounding like we've nailed it and we do a great job of it because we could definitely do a better job of it. Um, but yeah, it sort of opened my mind to the, the possibilities of how you could integrate the goalkeeping coach into a multidisciplinary team to sort of add more value to more players. And in terms of internal learning, um, do you get much opportunities to see up and down the pathway? So do you get an opportunity to see your PDP phase or the first team and the work that they do, etc.? Yeah, I think our club's really good for that. We, we've got sort of a strong track record of internal progression from sort of part-time into full-time staff. I think everyone's quite open in that you can go along you can just watch or you can get involved and yeah that's something that's sort of welcomed at, at our place and um, particularly sort of within within the academy so yeah that's been that's been good um I think back to sort of again times through COVID and one or two coaches have been off with COVID or one's had a kid or whatever the first team were in a bit of a disarray last season and sort of myself I've had the opportunity to be sort of essentially under 18s goalkeeping coach for a period of time, albeit very casually. Um, but that's probably experience you wouldn't have had at maybe one of your larger clubs. Um, likewise, 
the youth develop current youth development phase manager was sort sort of stepped up into I guess assistant under 18s coach. So you're getting a yeah a, a variety within your role, but you're getting opportunities to yeah learn internally off different people in in different environments. So that's something I've been probably lucky to to be able to take advantage of. And in terms of that jump, obviously you mentioned it was casual going into that eighteens, but is there anything in particular that you were like, right, we could do this better at the younger age groups or the way that they work here, actually that would probably work with us and that's something that I could steal and filter out to my guys. Perhaps just the, the preparation and the planning beforehand, before they go on the grass, everything was sort of set in stone with timings and at 10.15 this is happening at 11 we're on to this and this is where everybody fits in I think planning to that level of detail wasn't something that was overly common within either my own practice or the practice of the coaches I manage so that's probably something that maybe not so noticeably but maybe that's something that we've just sort of naturally taken or I've naturally taken back into our environment and we've sort of organically develop that within the, within the coaches within the phase probably but I think obviously like you're saying there it's probably relative to your group isn't it so you have kids that will want to go to the toilet halfway, halfway through your session which under 18s probably don't but it's making the opportunity of going well no we're going to try and stick to these timings wherever we can or these are our progressions that we're going to try and get through providing the players are you know, meeting the standard we expect and just having all of those contingency plans ready to go when necessary. Yeah, I think it'd be somewhat foolish to think this works with the under 18s, so we'll just take that and apply it with the under nines because as most people will know, that's probably not optimal and it probably won't work. Um so yeah, it was just finding ways that the experience I'd had up there would sort of benefit me in my role or us as a phase. Um and it, yeah, it probably happened and, implicitly or without really knowing um it's probably just something that has, has happened as a result of that and in terms of a study visit or something like that i know they're quite a big part of modern day coaching development and opportunities to go and see other clubs or other sports or other institutions is there any particular study visit that you've been on that's really impressed you and maybe challenged some of your conventional th thinking that takes place in football it, it's something I'm consciously trying to do more of. Um, I, I had a friend who worked with, with Manchester United women, so I went and spent a day there. Um, and that was impressive. They just saw every, everyone's nose, noses pointed in the, right, in, the, in the same direction. And, yeah, it was sort of a, a glimpse into an environment which I wasn't probably too familiar with. Um, I think... It's not necessarily a study visit, but I recently completed a master's at Leeds Beckett and that was really challenging at times of sort of maybe some of the beliefs I had or some of the thoughts I had. Um, I couldn't think of any in particular to give you an example, but I think sort of delving into coaching at, at that level with the calibre of coaches on the course, but also the calibre of staff delivering it was was really helpful for, for my learning, my development. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to, to complete a few more in, in the new year. Um, fingers crossed that happens and, and we'll see. Um, but yeah, that, that's probably all I've got for you on that one. How challenging is it for you to think about theoretical models in a practical setting? Because I'd imagine in a master's context and which you're coming from a degree background, etc., and even on qualifications, it can be difficult to go, right, here's the theor theoretical model but how does that actually work in, in reality? Um, so imagine going through that master's, that would have come up a, a series of times. So how challenging is it for you as an individual to go, right, um, this is what the model says. This is my experience. What can I actually use? And what of this do I think actually our environment can't cope with that right now? Or I'm not in the right phase or whatever to, to deal with that right now. Yeah, I think that's one thing that Leeds Beckett did really well in that they never said theory was more valuable than experience or vice versa. They just sort of said both are useful tools to inform you when you're on the grass. And ultimately, when you're on the grass, you go on what you're seeing anyway. Um, I think I've, I'd be, I've managed to, through the course, develop my sort of view of what coaching is and how everything interacts 
in order to to help players to get better or whatever. Um, and based on that, I could use a number of theories that I related to through my past experience to maybe be sort of lenses through which I can view my actual practice. Um, trying to think of an example. So if you if you took um, self determination theory as an example, in that people need um, competence, relatedness, and autonomy to feel sort of completely engaged with a task. When I'm designing, let's take our previous example, a session on resilience, I've got to be really careful that the the challenge point doesn't overstretch what the individual player's views of his own competence are, so that he just disengages and, and loses sort of motivation within the task. Um, so hopefully that's a useful example that makes sense. Um, within my mind, it's a little bit more simple, but it's always difficult to articulate the things that are sort of more tacit within your head. No, no, that makes complete sense. And I think that um, the common one that people use is like computer games they have a different level to challenge people or their competency. So. You know, if, if we all go and play COD right now against the Master COD players, we'd probably be in a world of bothering. I'm playing this and chuck your controller away, but being able to play against, you know, the easier version and they dial up the challenge re- relative to how you're getting on. So I think what you've used example there is, is a really good one. And I imagine that that for you is quite a pleasing, you know, being able to take the theoretical model and actually go, right, practically, this is how I can make it work or this is how I can actually implement it, um, which is quite useful. Yeah, definitely. I think that's probably something I lean on more than maybe some other coaches. Um, I think the one that had the most impact on me was there's a, a planning and reflective model where ultimately decisions about what practices we use and what behaviours we use in order to encourage learning will start with what we want the players to be able to know and do as a result of our coaching. This model is by Bob Muir. Um, it sort of encompasses all of that. It's got your, your objective, it's got your coach behaviours, your practice structure, but your player engagement as well. And then the more I've used that, the more I've started to recognise relationships between if the player's engagement's dropped, is it because the practice structure's not maybe that engaging? Has that had an impact on my coach behaviour? Because I'm getting frustrated because the players' engagement's dropped. So then I'm coming across a little bit more abrupt or a little bit more sort of harsh with the players. And I think when you've got it all in one place from your plan, you've got that in your mind when you're doing and then you reflect on it. That's been sort of something that's been really useful for me to develop my coaching from from where I was to, to where I am now. And I imagine that's a key of having diversity in your workforce as well, because you want different characters that can engage with different people. So, you know, if you're maybe more abrupt, I don't know if you are, but if you are more abrupt and maybe I'm more talkative, the individual that enjoys the abruptness might lean more so to you and the individual that loves a chat might lean more to me. Um, but having a coaching team that's quite diverse in its experiences, the way that it works allows players to be supported along that journey. Definitely. And I think even more so, you're speaking there, if I'm right, about sort of diversity within skill sets and personality, but even within like commonly held beliefs and thoughts in that if someone thinks about something in a different way to to, to myself, for example, it's either going to change my approach, which will make it better, or reaffirm my approach, which again, probably makes it better. So having sort of diverse thinkers within within your staffing is something that I've found to be beneficial as well. I'll give you a bit of time to answer this one. Do you have anyone who's a particularly diverse thinker? I, I've got one my end. He's an individual called Andy Eisenstrager. Um, I think he's in his 60s now. I might be doing him a disservice. But he um, he will sing with the kids. He will, do, like, do hurdles race them and stuff but actually the way that he acts with them is different for the kids and they really enjoy his sessions just because it's something that's completely out of the box it's like as mad as a box of frogs but it challenges you to go actually do I spend enough time having a laugh and a joke with them do I spend enough time um 
maybe sometimes joining in so that they can see that, you know, you can have fun. They want to see that role modeling. Is there anyone in particular that you can think of who is a real diverse thinker or diverse actor in Izzy's case that really challenges the way that you, you think and work? Yeah, we've, we've got one of our coaches who's very much like that. Um, the, co- the, the players love him because of his energy and his enthusiasm. And I always, I always look at it and go, well, I, how can I get to that level of, of energy or enthusiasm or not necessarily that, but how can I be that engaging within my own style? Um, we did have a, a part-time coach who's recently moved on. He was a real diverse thinker in that he was really set in his ways. Uh, he'd, he'd been through a lot of the Raymond Verheyen courses and things like that. And he was uh, yeah, really rigid within his views. So there was that challenge in my own views. Um, but then also there was a, a two-way thing in that we were both trying to influence each other with the best bits of each other's thoughts and and yeah provide the evidence to suggest that as well so um that's something that's been been really useful as well having those two go on sorry no no just having just having those two people within my staffing for for a period of time is yeah has been useful for that reason so this raymond (laughs) verheyen model what what does he look at what what type of beliefs does he have that maybe challenge conventional wisdom he was very much on the opposed side of things. Um, and we could end up being here until the end of the day. Now we've sort of opened this tin of worms, so to speak. But yeah, he's very much on the opposed side of things. It's very much on um, removing subjectivity from, from football and being more objective about things um, and ways to go about that. Um, so that would probably challenge in the way I see things, because personally I see benefits of unopposed practice for one. Um, but also taking that information, which, and, and again, I might be wrong because I've not been through it, but it seems to come from a performance-based environment. And how do you then take the good bits from that that are relevant to a development environment? And then which bits probably aren't as relevant because it is from a top-end performance environment, which might be working with sort of players that are seniors and, and whatever else. I think it's interesting because there's a lot of discussion at the moment around you know the use of small-sided games or isolated practice or or what that looks like and I know there are some people that have very strong views on the fact that everything should be small-sided games I know other people believe 1v1s but I think the bit you said there which is probably the most important bit is how do you make it relative to your environment and what you're working with and what the players need at that particular time um and one last question for me, um, which might be might be difficult for you, which is who's the, the best player or coach you've worked with or against and why? The best player I've worked against, um, and again, I it, it's a snapshot of it, but there was a young boy at Leeds, um, I think Eddie Gray, the Leeds legend, am I right in saying that? I'd, I don't want, to be, um, don't want to be disrespectful getting the names wrong or whatever, but I think one of his grandsons is involved in the, in the Leeds Academy and we came up against him and he was, so yeah, he was very, very good. It was almost like watching a young professional in a 11-year-old, 12-year-old body. Um, so that's, that's where I go with the player. Um, Coaching-wise, I think everyone's got their, their own little strengths. So I've, had, I've worked with some coaches who are phenomenal with people building relationships and making the players they work with feel valued. I've worked with some coaches who are tactically really, really astute and got great understanding of the game. Um, so, yeah, I've probably been blessed to work alongside some some really good staff along the way. Um, I couldn't pinpoint anyone for, for any certain reason, but I'd say that everyone's, yeah, really brought something different when you, when you are thinking about those that have had a real impact on you and, and whatever else. Perfect. Listen, Chris, really appreciate your time. Really good conversation. I'll catch up with you soon. No, thanks a lot. I've enjoyed it.
Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.